Hello, my name is David. I'm a researcher at Penn State University, and I'm going to talk today about the status of the Lux Zeppelin or LZ experiment. So LZ is a two-phase noble TPC um, or time projection chamber. Um, this is a technology that's been leading the way in the direct detection of dark matter. And generically, these detectors consist of a noble liquid target with a small gas layer on top, uh, hence two-phase. Uh, with photomultiplier tubes on the top and bottom of the detector as light sensors. Um, and in these detectors, when a interaction happens in the, in the liquid target, we see two signals, an S1 signal, which is prompt scintillation light, and a delayed response uh, produced by ionization electrons at the interaction site, uh, drifting under the influence of an electric field to the liquid surface where they are extracted um, in the gas phase, undergo electroluminescence, and produce a second burst of light, which we call S2. And the combination of these two signals, the S1 and the S2, allow us to determine the position of the event, uh, the energy of the event, and also uh, what type of recoil was produced. Uh, the lower left of this slide shows some data, some calibration data from the Lux experiment, which is the predecessor to LZ. And it shows the discrimination we can achieve um, when, when looking at um, electron recoils and nuclear recoils. Um, so in this data, the electron recoil is in the blue band, the nuclear recoils on the orange band in this parameter space, log S2 over S1 versus S1. Uh, this is a very powerful way to search for dark matter because most of our backgrounds show up in the electron recoil channel, uh, whereas our signal, at least from the WIMP uh, dark matter candidate, shows up in the nuclear recoil channel. And these detectors are consistently showing greater than 99% discrimination um, for a 50% nuclear recall acceptance. So everything I just described uh, can easily be applied to other direct experiments, detection experiments, um, but I'll start talking now about, about Luke Zeppelin. So this is a cross-sectional view of the LZ detector systems. In the middle, we have the central TPC volume. Uh, this sits inside of a Christat vessel, which is insulated to help maintain the liquid xenon at around 175 Kelvin. The region between the outer edge of the TPC and the inside wall of the Christnet vessel is instrumented in LZ with one and two inch PMTs. Uh, we call this the xenon skin region. Uh, this all sits inside of an outer vacuum vessel for thermal insulation. And surrounding the Christnet vessels is a near hermetic outer detector, which comprises of gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator held inside of acrylic vessels. Uh, this outer vest detector is viewed by um, 128 inch PMTs, uh, which are mounted inside of the water tank. And the water tank uh, itself is there to shield the inner portions of LZ from ambient backgrounds, from um, gamma rays and neutrons, from radioactivity in the cavern rock. LZ is hosted at the Sanford Underground Research Facility, uh, about a mile underground in Leeds, South Dakota. And this reduces the cosmic induced backgrounds to be subdominant to uh, backgrounds originating from the detector itself. So this kind of free one system improves our ability to distinguish uh, true dark matter signals from backgrounds. And the diagram at the top left of this slide aims to explain that. Um, so if we take the example of a WIMP, um, we obviously expect that to only scatter once inside of our xenon TPC before leaving. So it would produce a single scatter nuclear recoil. Neutrons could also do that, uh, but in LZ, we captured the outgoing neutron in the outer detector. Um, gadolinium has a very high neutron capture cross-section. And after the neutron capture, we see a cascade of a, 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 a approximately eight MeV of energy is deposited uh, in a cascade of gamma rays, uh, which is detected by PMTs in the, in the outer detector. In a similar way, the skin is a veto. Uh, so if we have some local radioactivity from a detector component, uh, that scatters once inside of the TVC, um, we can also detect that in the xenon skin and veto that event. Um, what does this do for us? Um, so, so the right-hand side of this slide shows some position um, um, distributions of uh, expected background events um, in a 6 to 30 kV energy window. These are just single scatter nuclear recoils uh, from our background model. 
And we can see that before vetoing, we have over 10 counts in a thousand days of, of runtime. And that's reduced by an order of magnitude after the application of the vetoes. Applying the vetoes also allows us to expand this fiducial volume, which is the represented by the black dash line. Uh, that's essentially the volume in which we would start to analyze events and look for dark matter, uh, discounting the outer sacrificial layer of xenon. Um, and that in itself just shows the, the one of the reasons we like to use xenon is because of its uh, self-shielding power, uh, basically absorbing um, external backgrounds um, in the outer layers of the, of the TPC. So I'm now going to move on to talk about the actual status of the experiment. Um, so here you can see that we've actually constructed our detector way back in 2019. Uh, we finished the construction inside of a radon reduced clean room. Uh, one of the things you can see from this picture is that the TPC fill cage is actually mounted inside of PTFE pieces. Uh, we choose PTFE because it has um, high reflectivity, which improves light collection inside the TPC. Sketched on this picture are the locations of electric grids. Um, and they define the active region of the TPC or where the forward field uh, is, is applied, and also the electron extraction region. Um, LZ will not oper operate at a nominal cathode voltage of uh, 50 kilovolts, uh, which gives an electric field of approximately 300 volts per centimeter. And this ensures that we can drift electrons over the full length of the uh, TPC, this uh, 1.5 meters from the cathode grid up to the extraction region. Also shown here is um, some instrumentation for the skim region. Um, so this is the region outside of the TPC fill cage, but um, inside of the inner Christat vessel. Um, you can see the PTFE paneling uh, on the inside of the vessel, again, for light collection reasons. Um, and this uh, region is instrumented with one inch and two inch PMTs. And you can see some of those PMTs in this right hand picture. This is as the skin uh, assembly had been completed. This slide shows some more pictures of inside of the detector and its clean room assembly. Um, on the left here, you can see the various electric grids um, and their sub-assemblies. Uh, so this is the cathode grid and the lower PMT array. Um, we have the extraction region assembly and then its attachment to the top PMT array. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, you can see the mating of the extraction region to the rest of the TPC here. Um, and then ultimately the insertion of the TPC into the inner Christat vessel. All of this happened inside of a very reduced clean room. And at the end, it was sealed up and transported underground. So here are some pictures of that activity. Um, actually, the size of the LZ in a vessel is basically determined by how, how big the shaft is uh, to transport these things underground. Um, on the right here, you see after some integration underground, we lowered the inner Christat vessel into the outer Christat vessel. Um, and then the final bit of integration on site was uh, uh, the attachment of, um, of, of a high voltage feed through. Um, this allows us to apply high voltage to the cathode and, and establish our electric field. So with a constructed detector, we then need to fill it with xenon. Um, as some of you will know, if you go out and buy xenon, um, it will contain parts per billion of levels of krypton. And this is a problem because uh, krypton-85 is a particularly dangerous background for dark matter searches. It produces a naked beta decay right in our energy region of interest. And so we have to reduce how much krypton is in the xenon uh, when we buy it. Uh, for LZ, we process all of our xenon, 10 tons of it, at Slack in a gas chromatography system. And that reduces the levels of krypton in the xenon to less than 300 parts per quintillion uh, PPT. When the xenon is on site, we need to um, constantly circulate the xenon to remove electronegative impurities. Uh, these impurities like oxygen and nitrogen uh, would impede drifting electrons in the TPC and limit our ability to see S2 light. Um, we purify the xenon in the gas phase by passing the gas through a hot zirconium getter. Um, the getter also removes methane, which is used as a carrier gas for certain long-lived calibration sources, such as tritium and carbon-14. Um, this phase change is handled efficiently by a separate cryogenics tower in LZ. And this diagram shows the flow of xenon around our system. We have compressors which pump xenon around the system. It passes through a getter in the gas phase. 
then enters this cryo tower where the xenon is condensed and put into the TPC. Um, on the other side, the, the liquid is drained away back into the cryo tower where it meets incoming warm gas and is evaporated and the, the cycle starts and the circulation system starts. Um, we also have a separate gas flow through a radon removal system. Uh, this is gas that's moving through conduits and breakthroughs, which contain cables at room temperature. And so uh, they emit a fair amount of radon. And so we remove that uh, using a special inline radon removal system. This slide just shows pictures of the elements I just discussed. Uh, so xenon actually arrives on site from Slack uh, in xenon packs. There are 12 high pressure gas cylinders per pack. Uh, and once the xenon is in the circulation system, we circulate at uh, 500 SLPM, which uh, turns over the 10 tons of xenons in around two and a half days. Um, and this is the cryogenics tower that I mentioned um, and the inline radon removal system uh, with a charcoal column uh, to, to, to uh, remove the radon. Last year, we actually commissioned a lot of this system in a dedicated underground test. Uh, we utilized the test cryostat um, in place of the real LZ cryostat, which was still being integrated at the time. So here's a picture of the test vessel. And a particular note is that we have the same liquid height in this test vessel as we will have in the LZ detector. Um, in the test, we demonstrated xenon flow um, at the nominal LZ flow rate of 500 SLPM and also higher flow rates too. Um, and then since then, more recently, we've cooled down the detector. Uh, so we do that through gas circulation and a nitrogen-based thermocycling system. Um, so here's a plot of um, just temperatures decreasing in the detector as we cooled it. Uh, the, the first 10 Kelvin of cool down is uh, something we treated very carefully because of the thermal properties of PTFE at room temperature. Um, but overall, this process took about three weeks. And now that the detector is cold, we're seeing LED traces uh, from um, LED calibrations that we do regularly um, on the PMTs uh, to establish the PMT response to single flow electrons. In parallel, we'll be making progress with our outside detector, which is one of the final subsystems to be integrated. Uh, we just discussed this a little bit earlier, but you can see here pictures of the final pieces of construction. So this is a picture of the acrylic vessels surrounding the cryostat vessels. Uh, this is inside of the water tank. So this is the inner surface of the water tank here. And then this is the final assembly with all of the PMTs in place. Um, we expect uh, that we can um, detect neutrons with a greater than 95% efficiency in the OD. This is for a 200 kV energy threshold, and a coincidence of 500 microseconds from any TPC trigger. And that really drives our predictions for um, the veto power of the acid detector. Finally, in terms of how our hardware items, I just want to mention the calibration systems, which are obviously essential to how we understand how a detector responds to physics. Um, so we broadly have three ways to deliver sources into LZ. We can inject them uh, into the xenon gas directly. Uh, we can lower sealed sources through dedicated conduits. Um, so conduits that sit between the inner and outer Chrysler vessels, or in a large conduit that's on top of the Chrysler vessel as shown here. We also have dedicated tubes penetrating the water tank in the OD so that we can deliver monoenergetic neutrons from outside of the water tank using a deuterium deuterium generator or DV generator, which has been used on LUX and other direct experiments such as Xenowantum. So this is where um, all this is leading. There is a talk by Amy Cottle um, about LZ physics and uh, our sensitivity to various uh, physics channels. Uh, but this is our uh, projected WIMP sensitivity, um, which is expected to have world-leading sensitivity, um, particularly for the vanilla uh, spin-independent WIMP nucleon cross-sections. Um, in terms of our backgrounds, we expect just over six background counts in our region of interest over the lifetime of the experiment, a thousand live days, and possibly half of that comes from radon dispersed throughout the xenon. We are sensitive to other physics searches. Um, I'll not spend too much time on this, but Amy has a, has a great talk uh, in this session that um, I would encourage you to listen to. But we are sensitive to other dark matter candidates like axions and other physics too. And I just want to finish by saying thank you for listening. Um, this is a really exciting time for uh, direct detection of dark matter with LZ, um, hopefully publishing some results very shortly. Um, so thank you for listening and I look forward to the panel discussion.